Hello, Judith. Hi, how are you today? I'm very well, thank you. And yourself? Likewise. Excellent. Close my mic doors, and an engine just keeps the keys. Hi, John. Hello. He did the maiden in treat. So we're the early birds. Apparently. We are, yeah. It's only a minute. Usually, Jerry's on pretty quick. Yeah. But I know he was. We're all busy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that way. <clears throat> I'm probably going to turn my video off because I was up late, slept late, and have an English muffin to eat before I'm <laughs> fully functional. I was going to run and see if I could make my. Uh, my my special non caffeinated coffee <laughs> before we start. But. Well, feel free. You know, yeah, maybe people, I'll do that. people turn off video and do what they need to while they listen because I mean, there's usually a lot of us on the call. Hey, Linda. <laughs> National anthem. Greetings. <laughs> Hi, Jerry. Good evening, Jerry. Hi. Hey there. How's everybody? Great. It's a sunny day in Minnesota. <laughs> Love that. There's still snow everywhere. Yeah. That, well, yes, but it's actually melting. Um, it's going to get up into the mid 30s today. <laughs> Crazy heat wave. For us, it is. <laughs> I mean, we had this Arctic purge a week or so ago, and it got down to minus 25 actual, let alone wind chill. So that's cold. That's cold. That's way cold. Uh, the coldest I've ever walked through, I think, was in Minneapolis when I went for a push conference that was held midwinter. And I remember running from like the car to the conference center, which was the museum. Uh, in like minus 30 or something like that. Yeah. I figured, okay, now I can say I've done that. <laughs> the speed of frostbite is intense. <laughs> yeah. And and somebody actually posted on my Facebook page that they un unwittingly, while they kneeled down to do something outside, they ended up with frostbite on their knee. They were doing something on their car, a tire or something. And they weren't even thinking about transmission of cold through fabric. <laughs> really macerated. <laughs> so. John, could you mute your mic? I talked to a Mountie one time and I asked him what the difference was because he worked up at 120 below and he said at 120 below your eyeballs freeze and you have to turn your head. Lovely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> That is crazy. You we don't, don't stay out long. Yeah, you don't you don't live out long. Maybe we should just kind of at some point do a mute all so that we lose the background. Uh, so I'm not host here. Hank is, and so I can't ask John. I can't mute John's line. Nor can I think. Nor can I mute everybody. I think. Let's find out. Ba -ba -da -ba -da. Yeah, I don't have affordances to do that. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Let's see if that works. No, that doesn't work. Um, John, John, John Kelly, come in, John Kelly. Let's come back on the All right. Um, I just put it in the regular chat. Yeah, exactly. I guess we're probably going to use Mattermost anyway. I should get yes, that please. Uh, let us use the Mattermost chat. Um, put a link to it here in the group. Calls. Copy link. And there we go. I haven't signed up for the Mattermost chat. Is that just a matter of a username and password, Jerry? It's a matter of most. Um, if you, I think, but Pete, correct me if I'm wrong, if you click on the link I just put in the Zoom chat, that uh -huh. should take you to a place where you can request 
uh, to register. Have you used Mattermost before? Are you, do you have a Mattermost account? No, no. Mattermost is like Slack, only more open source. Right. Okay. And so if you click on that link, it'll let you uh, register. And then once you uh, find your way into uh, Mattermost, you can then find the channel that I've put here, which is the OGM calls channel on our server. And that will bring you in here. Okay. John well, Kelly, John Kelly, are you back at your terminal? Darn. Okay. Um, cool. Uh, so Julian, that seems to me like a natural lead to that we should uh, start with you and Kevin because Kevin usually has a standing call uh, a little early as well. So let's go uh, Julian, Kevin, Scott for our check-ins. <laughs> okay, on uh, Sunday I interfaced, many people here are familiar with the brain. On Sunday, I interfaced it to Neo4j, which is a graph database. And this means that uh, instead of being locked into what the brain offers you for your data management, you can now use a real grown-up graph database. However, the tools to do that are a whole different category than what you would find in something like the brain but it, it opens up the possibilities to do that. Uh, naturally, I've hooked this to my own visualizer also and plan to experiment with more brains coming along. Uh, that is awesome. Okay. And Julian sent me a couple of videos uh, that he did with this sort of new animation. Uh, so it feels like there's sort of new, uh, <coughs> new frontiers. Uh, Gil, could you mute your phone as well? Actually, could everybody mute who's not uh, jumping in? John, we had a little bit of ambient noise from your uh, from your side before you came back to the to the mic. Um, cool. And so, um, Julian, I think maybe at some point we need to figure out how to do a uh, a demo either with my data or Climate Web or something like that, and 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 find a find a subset or a, a thing that is easy to illustrate uh, to show the power of the the visualizations you're doing. Yes. That sounds awesome. And, and yours is one of the first, I would say, yours would be one of the first experiments on where we're heading, which is uh, taking some extracted brain data and starting to do alternate user interfaces to it. Like how do we, you know, how else might we access all this data and all the, all the metadata that's in it? So. Yeah, it, it's gonna be us to, up to us though, because uh, you know, in the spirit of Free Jerry's brain, I, it's highly unlikely that the brain.com is going to implement anything that's going to let people stick their own data back into the brain. This is very likely, unfortunately, true. Um, so let's go Kevin Scott Bentley. Thanks. Uh, <clears throat> I put a link in both the Mattermost and the other thing of a thing I'm doing, been working on the racial wealth gap for friends and family funding. And we've got a thing where we can engage kids across race and class and economics over time with an annuity revenue thing that we're cranking out and uh, we're doing some presentations to faith-based groups around it. And the neat thing is that when the money comes back in, the affluent kids uh, are asked to sit down with the kids in the neighborhoods that they've uh, invested in and decide what to do with the money that will you know keep coming in uh, and that also that it um, be put into something that won't come ha happen before five years so they they're both basically you're giving kids money to design the future together so it's kind of a cool thing uh, that uh, can continue a long time and then one other thing that's happening working with pete and some uh, on some indigenous uh give land back using blockchain uh, <clears throat> there's a bunch of uh, digital currency folks who want to be sovereign who've been approaching tribes as sovereign nations to say let us pay you a bunch of money to be sort of weirdly sovereign and somehow away from the u.s government here and they're a little afraid of that because you know they've they've been settled before and so one of them reached out to me and, and some of them and so we're trying to see if we can do, use the blockchain to preserve indigenous land and we've got something where it's you know kind of gaia becomes a corporation that they are then trustees of on their land so we're, we're going to see if that works and just anyway pretty interesting thing appreciate pete's help on it Super. Thank you, Kevin. What's the frequency? I mean, it sounds like you're trying to build longer term relationships and conversations between 
the investors and the investees, for example, yeah. do you have like a rhythm of communications for them so they get to kind of know each other as humans? Yeah, well, that's that's the thing. We're we're setting up the, this fund, and we're and and as the money comes in, it will come in annually over twenty five years from the first investment. And if you do it the second year, it'll just keep coming in. And so we're saying to the kids, you know, let's get you know your AME Missionary Baptist Black youth group together with the, you know the presbyterian kids and and say the money's coming let's design a future <clears throat> and because it's long term we can think about things like you know uh degradation well particularly there's a thing on degradation in a creek here in a black neighborhood called the nasty branch you know we, you can think long term about some things that way and and so you know they'll, they'll work together to design but then they'll get different new money every year so they'll have to re redo their design but each time you're supposed to look at least five years out. Sounds really cool. Thank you. It should be fun. And you know, when you do that kind of thing and the kids are putting some money and the grandparents usually say, well, I'll put $3 down because you know, they're putting other money down. But, but the other part is, that is neat is a cross race, a cross class designing the future. That's the and, simple part of it. And a little bit of money from a lot of people that turns into long-term conversations and planning, it sounds just awesome. Yeah, yeah. And then we're solving the racial wealth gap by investing in friends and family funding for entrepreneurs who don't have a rich uncle who can't get into the loan funds. And so, you know, then it's solving that part of the thing. Mm -hmm. So, Thanks, Kevin. Godspeed. Uh, Scott Bentley Gill. Hey, everyone. Um, I wasn't sure what to share today. So uh, two things. The first one was I discovered something called a Petri net. P-E-T-R-I, like Petri dish, Petri net. It is a, a graphical way of diagramming a workflow based on states and transitions. And that's basically all it is. And the way I saw it taught was um, states of a traffic light. And yet it turns into this extremely robust, massive way to look at, at workflows. And yet it's just, Simple and obvious to look at. So Petri nets. Um, I'll put some links to that in the uh, in the chat because I thought that was a really interesting thing. Um, the second thing is, um, I read an article called Pace Layering, and it's a really interesting concept that I'd never heard of before. But the the gist of it is that if you're looking at the, the layers of complexity consider length of time. And so, for example, fashion and art, commerce, infrastructure, governance, culture, nature. It's one example. And, and the idea is that fast learns, slow remembers. Fast and small instructs the slow and big by innovation, by shaking things up, by the churn, by the, you know, that kind of thing. The slow and big controls the fast and small by keeping some stability, adding constraints, adding constancy. And fast gets all the attention, slow has all the power. And it's this really interesting dynamic um, of why they're, why they exist together. Again, I'm going to put that in a, uh, in, in the chat, but the big takeaway for me was this idea of a shock absorber. So it's this, it's the thing that's small and moving very quickly so that this thing doesn't go like this all the time. It's this so that the whole system can move around and it needs the shock absorber to be able to mediate between the constant change and the new, but it needs the stability of the big thing. Otherwise it's, it's like this all the time. And so I thought, for me personally, what are my shock absorbers? What are the ways that I'm interacting and not letting this shake my whole system? And, but, but it can inform that. So it was just an interesting concept that I've been just, just learned about, so. And I think the pace layer thing comes from Stuart Brand and probably predates him. And as you were describing it right now, it made me think, isn't that how automatic transmissions work? There are basically plates that are in a transmission liquid. And when the plates move and, and, are, and move next to each other, they start then engaging and moving. So you don't need to replace the clutch action. 
but but the pace layers are, are sort of usually represented as kind of spheres around a globe or around a sphere. And, and you know, the, the, the pace of genetic change is much slower than the pace of cultural change is much slower uh, than the pace of a fad, like a YouTube fad, like uh, lolcats or, uh, or the GameStop short squeeze or something like that. Um, but it seems like there's, there's we, we've actually mechanically produced some things that work this way. Thanks, Scott. It was it was Stuart Brand, and the uh, the second part about it that was interesting was how it was presented. So when if you happen to click on the article and look at it, it was a really interesting way of saying here's the topic, here's the summary, here's the here's the body of the of my proposition, and then at the end there was a section of here's where this came from. I learned about this at this time in the nineteen. 90, I did this in 1970, that's where it came from. And, and so I thought it was really, really well done. Sweet, thank you. And I, uh, I had it in my brain because I put the link in here, but I didn't have it connected to useful thinking frameworks and models. So I made that link because it, it is a very useful uh, thinking framework for those kinds of things. Um, so thanks. Uh, so let's go Bentley, Vincent, Ken. Hello everyone. Um, yeah, just on a personal note, I finally have a paying client <laughs> and, and that means, uh, so I do, for those that don't know, I do, uh, uh, web and mobile app development and, uh, and, uh, I solve problems, uh, and I use code when necessary, um, and no code tools too. Um, so, and you know, that means that I have more time on my runway to play with OGME stuff. And the great thing about that also is that I think I met. Uh, this person through OGM. So their project is very OGM-y um, for a client in Sweden and stuff. So um, it's, it's using Miro, connecting it to Airtable, and so helping to visually um, display data. Um, so you can imagine that that's very OGM. -y, so that's great. Um, and then uh, the, my other OGM-y project, uh, Goliebot, um, no real status update there. Uh, for those that haven't heard, it's a uh, it's a character that reduces divisiveness and misinformation on the internet by having a uh, evidence-based discussion over Twitter, which sounds like a contradiction in terms, doesn't it? <laughs> it but does you sound can, a little suspect, but I, yeah, I, I, you, I hear you. you can you can follow the link from Twitter and see Goalie's brain, uh, uh, just like kind of like Jerry's brain, except Goalie um, is trying to figure out a um, a contentious issue. And you can see all the evidence and the score that Gola gives it and how each evident, piece of evidence impacts the top score. Um, so kind of a, an invite to this group is anyone who thinks that that's an interesting project uh, or has time to give me a review and feedback. And I'd be happy to swap my time uh, as you know, a technologist to help with any technology issues. Um, uh, so that, just reach out to me. Bentley at bentleydavis.com is email. Um, I will do yeah. so, Bentley. That I absolutely relate to that. Thank you so Good, much. Nice one. Sounds great. And and I think that chatbots are just underappreciated, underestimated, underused because they're inexpensive, tireless. Uh, people seem to relate to them very easily, very quickly. Like there's not a big technology mountain to climb over, um, all that kind of stuff. Uh, we'll put the link in the in the Mattermost chat as well. Oh yeah, uh, um, I got to go to Mattermost. Yeah, that's okay. Um, but I'm really, really glad you're experimenting with this. That's uh, it's a very cool thing. And then the natural language parts of this must be must be fun to mess with. Uh, I'm I'm actually skipping AI and natural language for now, and it's going to be processed by me and hired social media staff because it is it is at a level that. The, the technology is just not there yet. Um, and actually, I don't know if the human brain is there yet. So we'll see. Because, because I want to take, you know, 50 people come back to me saying, um, you know, taking the, the vaccine is going to cause infertility. And I have to figure out a way to <laughs> raise that in a way that's not telling people a misinformation. But mm -hmm. so right now it's mostly manual, except for the math of showing how Gullibot makes its analysis of the data, um, but uh, eventually putting some AI and natural language processing to speed up the process. 
And might you, like one of the things you, I can envision doing is routing people towards some kind of statistical literacy uh, that it, that it, like how to how to get kids to eat their broccoli that isn't actually like a statistical literacy package, but rather a game or some some interesting way to realize that there is an incidence of bad incidents. I think I got that right around vaccinations, but it pales in comparison to what happens when you actually get the disease. And therefore, you know, there's risks on both sides. But check this out. Um, and I'm hoping that'll be kind of intuitive when someone's going through the content because they'll see how Goliebot analyzes the risks and de develops the score. So they'll see an intuition saying, oh yeah, some people have gotten sick when they take it. Um, or they're, you know, that, yeah, that, you, so you'll see how that weighs in and the total thing and, right. and you could get into the math and see why. So yeah, I'm hoping it'll be one of those things that as people explore it, their uh, statistical literacy will go up and also their ability to uh, interest, be introspective on their own uh, uh, how episteme their whole understanding of how they think and why <laughs> their think epistemological it. understanding, However, right? Yeah, so there you go. Yeah, that's it. And also build humility, right? Because if you could say, Oh, this is simple, and then you go in there and like, Oh, I didn't think of that. Oh, I didn't think of that. Oh, I didn't think of that. Then it's yeah. kind of like, Oh, maybe I need to not yell at people on Twitter when they say something that I disagree with. It's interesting. I, I just recently got a shingles shot. I hadn't sort of gotten a shot in a while. I guess I got my flu shot, but they don't, they don't explain the flu shot every year. But for this one, there was a new protocol where my doctor sort of held up a chart that had you know, a little diagram of 100 people and then little dots on. This is, this is sort of how many cases, blah, 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 blah. This, these are the kinds of reactions. And it was a visualization of what might happen. I'm like, wow. oh, this is interesting and new. That's um, great. So clearly they're trying to figure out some way to get people to understand how things play out. So anyway, uh, thanks so much, Bentley. Um, I've lost my, lost my cue. Uh, Vincent Ken Judy. Hi, everyone. Um, so this has been a super productive week for myself and especially on Catalyst. Um, thanks to a few people who are in the call. Um, I had a meeting with Peter, Mark, Antoine, and we were able to figure out how to um, basically pull out a CSV from the brain to be able to import into Airtable. So I've been playing around with some test data in Airtable, and next week I'll have some exciting uh, like stuff to show from that. Um, I just kind of figured out how to, um, with Bentley's help, kind of dive into the Airtable script. So I could definitely recommend Bentley's service. He's taught me so much this week, especially with kind of like transitioning from no code, low code to like starting to code um, and basically figuring out how to um, like pull metadata from URLs and then put that back into Airtable automatically. And so kind of being able to get a lot more like rich data out of, um, out of links and, um, so yeah, I'm working on some experiments with like resource lists um, that should be done within a week or so. Um, and then also I had uh, done uh, at Kika Lab a little demo of the kind of like community aspect that I'm working on with Catalyst. And uh, on if anyone wants to kind of dive in deeper, Monday at 2 Eastern, right before the Kika Lab call, I'm going to be kind of doing a, a little kind of like demo Q&A. Um, before kind of launching anything and just to kind of get feedback. Um, and that'll be on the, the shared calendar as well. Um, so yeah, super excited. And um, besides that have been um, involved with the System Innovators Club on Clubhouse with Charles and others. Um, we had our third like consecutive meeting, which basically in clubhouse lingo that lets you apply to be like an official club. So that also is kind of picking up and uh, there's like more systems innovators emerging, which is really cool, kind of like starting to come together, um, just like system sinkers and from lots of different countries and backgrounds. So um, might see some of those people kind of coming into. Um, yeah, so that's my update. Do you want to riff a tiny bit on your experiences in Clubhouse just for everybody? Yeah, as, as Pete types his Clubhouse gateway drug. <laughs> Love it. Do you want to just talk about what it's like for you and what's, what's worked and what hasn't? 
sure. Yeah. So, um, so I've been in like, there are some clubhouse rooms where like you join a room and then a few random people or strangers pop in and you, it's kind of just like a serendipitous, it's like a serendipity engine. It's like you just have these like spontaneous conversations with random people, but most of the people on there, um, at least like, because it's through this like follow graph, I guess, the people are kind of like interested in similar things in you. And so in some ways it's helping you find people that are really just like you, but also from like all over the world and different experiences. Um, it's not based off content. It's mostly just based off of what rooms that you usually go in. And so I've had some really like small conversations just about like going deep into like systemic racism, like similar to the conversations we have here. Um, and then on the other side of the spectrum is like, I was invited to co-moderate a room on like what comes after capitalism. And we had 500 people show up and then we're moderating a room of like 500 people with like 40 people on stage, all wanting to jump in to talk about like kind of future economic systems. And so that's kind of like the, the spectrum of, of conversations. Um, I even like jumped into a, a rap freestyle room where people were going around like 30 seconds each and like had like a rap beat in the background and they were just like freestyling and that was really cool um because it was just like a very improvisational like anyone could go up and just jump in the queue um and it, yeah that got me super energized so I feel like Clubhouse is kind of like conference vibes for anyone who like loves going to conferences and networking but like with like different rooms that you can go into and talk to people, but like all the time on your phones, but really addicting. And uh... so what you said really like that, that snapped in place something, which is one of the gaps in virtual events is the hallways. Like, like we're not bumping into people, like go, having been slammed into Zoom during pandemic means the random conversations are completely missing. So it feels to me like like um, Clubhouse is filling that space actually quite nicely because the, the the audio is high quality, the interface is brutally simple. Like there's not much there. Um, I can't figure out how to do half the stuff because there's like no affordances. Um, but but it's it's kind of doing that in some interesting ways. Hmm, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, did, anything else you did you want to say about it? Yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I love the idea of like, yeah, it's like there's a ha hallway when you first open the app, it's like the only thing there, it's a hallway with a bunch of rooms and then you pick which ones you go into. And I think, uh, yeah, like this week, Bill Gates was in a room and then there's like overflow rooms from like people wanting to talk about Bill Gates talking in other rooms. So it's really interesting. Um, and there's a few very like niche clubs that I found out about that um, are really, really like, it's great just seeing the paradigms kind of come together. Like, I feel like the last few weeks has been me realizing the paradigm of there being multiple paradigms because on clubhouse, you have like all these people intersecting one another. Right. So like, um, like the tendency, cause we're, if we're in these calls every Thursday and we're like mostly in just these calls, we're going to tend to start to kind of like, coalesce around similar worldviews and there might be other groups that are doing the same thing but they're like coalescing it around like a different basin of attraction like and so it's interesting then seeing those people talk to each other now and seeing kind of like these very like the broadest perspectives possible I feel like love that and, and I I'm I love evanescent things, and yet I don't like Snapchat. I don't like things that vanish because when somebody says something just brilliant, I just want to save it and put it right next to all the other good stuff that, that was great like that. So it's, it's just weird for me to, to see so much good evanescent conversation just happening. So anybody else have strong feelings about Clubhouse? Uh, John. Yes, uh, very similar. I agree with everything uh, Vincent said. It's it's even deeper and weirder than than might come across initially. Yesterday morning, I was driving uh, home from an overnight, and there was a philosophy uh, room, and they were reading Plato's Republic together. And in the room, you had a lot of Middle Easterns. Yeah, I mean, well, Balkans actually. You had Greeks, 
uh, people from Croatia, whatever. And they introduced this strange theory that I had never heard that uh, there's a higher amount of Neanderthal genes in the Balkans, which explains a certain amount of their, whatever you want to call it, their uh, tendency to get into conflicts. And, you know, it was just like this very strange thing. But among the strangest things about it was that this was like a, a regular philosophy class, completely free, completely come as you are, come, you know, here we are, we're just going to gather, we're going to read uh, Plato in translation, but we're going to have real Greeks and real Croatians and all these other people, and they're going to argue about this stuff. And they're actually doing it right now. They're, today they're arguing about Parmenides, who's a, wow. a pre-Socratic philosopher. At the same time, yet all the stuff you heard about Bill Gates, yes, rooms that are entirely in Russian, rooms that are entirely in Chinese and Spanish, other languages. Yeah. Uh, another room that was this morning was should should tech fund journalism. There are 500 people in that room. Facebook was in that room. Facebook had their, their guy who's supposed to help small publications. The Australians were in that room going over wow. the conflict, um, you know, with the, between Facebook and everything. Uh, I mean, it was incredibly rich, incredibly complex. I have this, the feeling you have, Jerry, that, you know, wow, this is really something. What, 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 you know, it's, it's gone. Yeah. And, you know, your only, your only mode of capture is to follow one of the speakers and then get to their Twitter and then DM them. You know, I mean, it's like it's a it's an elaborate kind of process to try to uh, create some lasting bonds or something. Yeah. You know, some slower moving. Though I guess the only way you create something slower moving is you, you create a room and then you start to draw around you the people who might then summarize or pull in uh, the interesting changes that are happening in other rooms. That's amazing. I, and earlier when you're talking about the philosophy room, I, I thought you were going to say, and then Plato showed up. Yeah, right. <laughs> like, wow, that'd be pretty cool. Yeah. Well, they're actually, they're, it's very funny because yesterday, the guy reading uh, Plato's dialogues actually had had figured out a, a kind of a, a vocal uh, theatrical technique. And so when he was Glaucon, he had a certain kind of Archie Bunker <laughs> tone. That's great. In English with an accent, you know. And then when he was, uh, you know, uh, Socrates, or you know, he had this. Other, you know, it was it was really funny, actually, how he how he I'm, put it together. I'm willing to bet that in a couple of years, GPT-10, fed all of Plato's works, will pretend and sound like Plato and engage in the conversation as a bot, and and Gullybot will have grown up to be a a Clubhouse 10 participant or something like that. I mean, we're heading, we seem to be heading in that way. At least, at, you know, if you slow it down a little bit, a little bit to writing. Uh, the, the machine learning stuff seems to be getting pretty damn good at certain domains. Yep. Uh, the, right. the, co the common sense reasoning in a conversation about anything, I think that's pretty far away. But, but narrow it down to what Plato might have said about X, and it, that could work. I don't know. Yeah, at least it's, a, it's the kind of approximation of an answer that you might get from, say, a classics professor. Yeah. Who, not perfect, not necessarily right but in the ballpark with footnotes you know that would be okay that's valuable it's lovely lovely um thank you very much uh ken hey. judy doug uh, julian did you want to jump in on that or, or do you have to leave uh, the call yeah i have to leave the other okay. thing that's starting now <laughs> thanks julian all right we'll see you next week sorry gil has ken, his hand up gil did you want to say something yeah, just real quick, what they said about Clubhouse, fascinating and weird. Um, the thing that I'm finding, uh, my first experience was, I thought this is a club for monologists. Uh, you know, just few, you know, single people going on uh, at, at great length. Now it's becoming more and more conversational, or at least the groups that I'm finding myself in are more conversational. Uh, what I'm missing most is a kind of chat function. There's no way to interact individually with other people in a room. Uh, and I find that the... I, I, I miss that. I want that. That may be something that's coming down the road. Um, it's, uh, I was very struck in my early encounters at um, the percentage of people of color. Um, and I don't know if that's a al random or algorithmic or representative of the population, but very different than most of the environments that I'm in. Um, and it uh, seems to me there, there are a lot of people who are peddling very hard. Uh, to build presence and find ways to monetize this. Uh, you know, a, a lot of the people I see have, you know, a few hundred followers. Uh, some people have 
tens of thousands of followers. And there's some people who have millions of followers already, which is kind of startling. So I don't know what, I don't know what the game is on that, but there's that. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, as folks said, some surprisingly rich and fascinating conversations. Um, it's funny. We could, take, we, we, could, we could take OGM on there and it would blow, it would blow up. I'm wondering, yeah. Um, and we... Um, which may or, not, may or may not be a good thing, Jerry. I don't know. I know, exactly. The first thing that struck me was how diverse the, the people were in on Clubhouse. Like it was way more diverse than anything I've been on, am on, uh, yeah. fall into typically, which was fabulous. Um, and then also, uh, Julian, when you said Gil has his hand up, or uh, Kevin, when you said Gil has his hand up, I'm like, but his avatar always has his hand up. What do you mean? Um, so now I understand what you meant. Um, sorry, I can't hear you. Is that a request to change my avatar? Uh, no, 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 it's good. It just looks like you're always calling for attention, though. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to put I, in I, here. I think of it as my hex, as, as my hex uh, avatar. Yeah, exactly. You, hex, hex on you. Oh, sorry, Ingrid, go ahead. Oh, hey, I was just going to say, since I'm in Europe, I keep waking up to see all these great conversations happening at two and three in the morning. And I'm like, when am, when am I going to get on anything? Because it's just not going that much over here. So, um, or I'm missing it, maybe. I don't know. It's kind of funny. It's interesting. I wonder, anybody else from Europe having experiences on Clubhouse? I don't know. And, and does Clubhouse have a, have a rhythm or a schedule sort of for traffic because of where it's pick, been picked up around the globe? It There's sure a lot of stuff in Europe, I know, because when I get up, it, it, there's stuff three or four hours before I get up. So it's, you know, it's in GMT time. That I, yeah, I, I have to look and see what's happening. For some reason, I'm getting all the other ones in, in America, mm. though. <laughs> hmm. Ingrid, there's like a whole like Nordics community that really then is. if you follow those people, there's a bunch of other <laughs> rooms that all the other people in Europe and there's a Undavos group that's in Sweden, uh, Switzerland. Okay. All right. I'm on it because I used to live in the Nordics. So I, the, I got to yeah. I didn't think about that. But of course, it's like Nordics the little Silicon is, Valley up a whole there. Lot of, yeah, there's a whole Nordics climate kind of group. Okay. Very cool. <laughs> So now we can make it back to the queue. Uh, uh, sorry, go ahead, Kevin. No, we can't. Yeah. yeah, it was just I had to drop off. I, I posted that blog post about the thing I mentioned, and I've had uh, two, two realistic pilots come up in the last hour, so I had to go off and respond to them. But it seems to be taking off pretty, pretty well. It's pretty lightweight. That, was that is awesome. Cool. Yeah. That is awesome. Thank you. Uh, Ken, Judy, Doug. Hello, everybody. Um, I finished uh, Cast, The Origins of Our Discontents this week, um, which is a very lengthy Such book. Such a good. And, yeah, really great, great book. And it was, <clears throat> excuse me, um, I was on a, uh, a webinar the other night. I think John Kelly was there. I know uh, Julian was there. It was about the future of democracy. Um, and uh, I was really struck. There were three speakers and none of them were addressing the issue of race. Um, and they were looking at Trump you know, from the lens of, of people feeling like their religion and their gun rights were under attack, there was no mention of, you know, the role that racism was, was playing in this. And I was furiously typing in the chat, you know, things I'd learned from caste and, and uh, it just brought to the fore, you know, for me, how most white people really do not understand um, the role of, of race and racism in this country. And, you know, someone said, oh, people, white people don't want to talk about slavery because of guilt. I don't, I, I think that might be true for some white people, but I think there's there's a much larger, people don't want to talk about slavery for a lot of other reasons besides guilt. And, um, you know, guilt is just one small snippet of that. So I just was very struck by that the other night. There was some very, you know, good information that came forth, um, some scary information, you know, this idea of a, a long night coming and uh, the way that corporations, you know, when someone said, uh, one of the speakers said, you know, when, um, Twitter uh, deep platform Trump, essentially they were performing a political function and you know, no one else could shut him up. And, and so now corporations have this inordinate control um, that, that we used to be belong to the government is now seated in corporations. And I'm not quite sure how I feel about that, but it was an interesting point. So there's just been a lot of stuff in my, my mind spinning around, um, you know, what is the future of democracy? Uh, how are we going to get together here and, and make this work? And then I listened to a talk by Charles C. Mann, um, whose book, The Wizard of the Prophet, I'm also in the middle of reading. Um, and uh, this, he was at the Long Now Foundation. And I, I won't go into it, but 
he mentioned something in the Q&A at the end of this talk, and I'll put it in the Mattermost chat. Um, you need three things for an industrial revolution. You need steel, and that's pretty readily available. You need energy, and we have a lot of sources of that. And you need rubber, because synthetic rubber doesn't actually work very well. And rubber is actually um, very much under threat. There is, uh, you know, there's, there's only, it, it, it only grows in certain conditions and it's subject to certain pests. And um, if you go to Brazil, there's a huge rubber plantation. I didn't realize this. He said, you know, in the, I think the 1930s, Henry Ford spent a billion dollars making Portland, a rubber yeah. plantation and it, it didn't work. It was the biggest loss of, of his empire, right? Yeah. Um, and so now there's rubber found in Brazil and in Southeast Asia. And there's pests in, in the rubber uh, plantations of Brazil. And if you happen to go to Southeast Asia and you have Brazil stamped all over your passport, there's no protocols for making sure you're not carrying Sorry, I'm trying to get this stuff. onto a headset here. So um, it made me realize just how vulnerable we are. Um, I mean, there's a lot of vulnerabilities, but I'd never thought about what happens if all of a sudden rubber goes away in a hurry. Um, that's going to bring down a tremendous amount of stuff. So... I, I don't have any answers. I'm just sitting here with all of this new information turning in my head going, we're, we're way, way far from equilibrium here. And it's really hard to know. For sure, we're in an inflection point, but <clears throat> is it moving in an inflection point where it's going to go positive or negative or kind of, you know, I, I just don't know. So I'm just sort of sitting with all this, this stuff churning in my brain, wondering what to do with it. So I come and dump it here in, in OGM. <laughs> Yay, a good place for it. Uh, Pete, was ferrous metallurgy invented by Ferris Bueller? I, I, exactly, yes. Yeah, and, and a really and a lot of uh, a lot of coal or something like that. Yeah, uh, Ken, thank you for putting the the link in the chat. Appreciate that a lot. And I love Charles Mann. His books, fourteen ninety one and fourteen eighty three, were really really important for me because he put a lot of stuff together very nicely. And uh, Wizard and the Prophet is fantastic. I highly recommend it. Um, my reading list is way too long. I know, mine too, but I've been listening to it, which is, you know, yeah. so it makes it easier. So all we need to do now is switch to a completely oral oral uh, information art architecture, because we'll be on Clubhouse all day long, and when we're not on Clubhouse, we'll be listening to podcasts, and when we're not on podcasts, we'll be listening to audiobooks. Perfect. Uh, Scott? I'm not on Clubhouse, but I have a question about some of the things you said earlier. It's just this idea of your response uh, Jerry, to Twitter, is that you're kind of ladling from the stream. You're not trying to capture everything. It's just sort of this ongoing thing. And I'm wondering if the oral side of things, do we get to the point where we're porch sitting and we're just kind of talking and we're not feeling the need to constantly capture and follow each thing down? And if, if that's uh, something that happens. I think that's the strength of, of uh, Clubhouse is that it's immediate and it's only that oral medium and you make up the rest in your head. By the way, I've got a show we're doing repeatedly now called The Good Pitch that's tomorrow evening at uh, 6.30. <clears throat> and it's like, uh, as opposed to Shark Tank, it's, this is like a porpoise tank where we help you get to shore. So we've got about five people doing it. It's, it's, we did it once and it was pretty fun. We're gonna, we're gonna do it regularly. And then we'll give out uh, 15 minute meetings with us if we find you interesting or, or if you want them, that kind of thing. Anyway, the good day say, tomorrow at 6.30. Can I just say how much I like where, where we help you get to shore? That's like the best tagline. <laughs> okay, thank I you. Mean, thank por porpoise tank was good. It's like, okay, shark tank. And it's like, where we help you get to shore. Oh, right, right, cool. That's what they do. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's fabulous. Yeah, the alpha ego uh, has to demonstrate itself through generativity. So that's that's a, it's a different place. Can you put a link in, Kevin, to your, to your thing tomorrow? Yeah, well, it's it's on Clubhouse tomorrow, and but then we've got a site. I can put the link to the site that uh, uh, Natil set up, uh, and I, I'll do that. What's the Clubhouse follow, though? Um, me, I guess, or or... You know, I'm not the one doing that part of it, uh, so uh, I'll go. I'll go try to find out. Okay. Awesome. Uh, let's go, Judy Doug Ingrid. Um, well, as I mentioned yesterday in another group, I'm really trying to hone my different energy zones into some cohesive central theme, so that when I'm working on something, it benefits multiple groups. 
And I'm kind of right now for the moment, oddly, stepping back into a bit the science-y side and the science of the future that's necessary for the industry of the future and the lack of representation of diversity in those fields and what are the specific things that we can change in the systems to assure that we get rich creative thought from every possible human being into critical zones of development for the future. Um, interestingly enough, national societies at the professional society level or at the level of the National Science Board, NSF, NIH, and so forth, are all starting to actually program on that in webinars. And there's some really rich content about changes in graduate education and other areas. So I guess if you want to tag me, diversity, education, and human evolution, I guess, would be. Because um, it's really about learning to be better people, more complete people, more participatory people. Um, so well, I think it's pretty exciting, actually, but a little overwhelming. From those, from those conversations and those meetings, and I'm thrilled that they're happening, what seems to be working? What, what, what thing that gets said or done is catching on and seeming to help a lot? I think shifts in mentoring models actually is what's helping the most from what I'm hearing in the sense that um, somebody from the National Science Board said yesterday, we need to shift from a single mentor in the sciences like your PhD advisor to a collective mentor that includes peers as well as other people. And so it's a social dynamic change that in, sort of recognizes that people have superficial visual differences, but they may be at the heart very similar they just look a little different. Um, and so the complexity then of seeing, having, you know, each person has different strengths and gaps. And I used to talk to employees about composite mentors when I was back in industry, because, you know, the guy you want to talk to for finance isn't the same guy you want to talk to for a scientific question, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that, that the recognition of that in an educational system is a really exciting prospect because it starts to move pedagogy into mainstream learning. And, and I've been kind of struggling a little even with the use of the word learning because it, it seems directional. You know, somebody knows they're gonna tell you as opposed to discovery, you know? And so it, it evolves as you go on in school, but anyhow. Interesting. That's kind of, kind of where my energy is and it's really, refreshing to see all of these groups starting to program in these areas, yeah, which is different and actually getting into the layers of specificity like, okay, so you're in a conference, you know, is it, it's the responsibility of the moderator <clears throat> to say, by the way, these are our policies. These are the kinds of behaviors we expect. And if there are behaviors that you don't think are appropriate, you have a responsibility to try to get the two people together and have a conversation and, and do low level resolution. <clears throat> but they're starting to build in consequences. If you are a repeat offender, you might not be able to come to national meetings. <laughs> mm. uh, and so that's an interesting model, um, but it's just the visibility has changed in such a dramatic way to seeing this as just as important as what are the emerging fields. The emphasis before was all on the emerging fields and the publishing model and the tenure practice is now being, it's being recognized that we need to add other dimensions to effective advancement protocols in order to get the best people doing things. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Judy. I put the links people ask for in this chat and the other chat, and it's called the good pitch and it's the good pitch .club if you're in Clubhouse. So thanks. Great, thanks. Thank you. Awesome. And we're trying to use Mattermost chat, if at all possible, in all ways. And if you have trouble, my apologies, Pete. Uh, Pete is our best troubleshooter for, for getting I put, you I put it there. in both places just because some people don't. Yeah. It, exactly. it turns out we've got one problem. Uh, AOL isn't accepting uh, emails from uh, Mattermost right now. So oh. if you're trying to sign up with an AOL account, uh, it, it won't go. It'll bonk. So, okay. Man, Are you talking to people with AOL accounts? <laughs> Hey, don't just hey, say some of others. us are on this call. <laughs> <laughs> I still have an Earthlink account, <laughs> which oh, is my goodness. sometimes there. I've, I've got Gmail, Earthlink, and Comcast. Mostly so, because wow. any, only one time somebody's down. <laughs> wow, so no Hotmail then? <laughs> no, never did Hotmail. I couldn't, I couldn't bear having an account that was called Hotmail, so I ne never went there. <laughs> um, it, it's just like, uh, yeah, anyway. Um, so Doug, Ingrid, Craig. Okay, uh, 
there's so much going on in this conversation this morning. It's kind of a microcosm of what's happening in the bigger world that there's a tsunami of new conversations. And it, it becomes almost impossible. In fact, you can't navigate for it. You've got to avoid a lot of it. Uh, so since my main interest is in thinking of what's the mind space between now and the future, uh, mm. I need strategies for coping with all that stuff. And one that I've been working with lately is looking not for what's being said, but what's not being said. It is what are the hidden assumptions behind the conversation? And that's actually a more stable structure than the stuff that's being spoken. So it actually reduces the information flow, but it, it enhances its quality, I think. Um, Along that line, there's several things that have been on my mind this week. I've been trying to track uh, Daniel Schmachtenberger and his thinking. He's such an interesting character and uh, a, a little glib, but boy, he knows a lot and it's worth thinking about how he sees things. He tends to be looking at logical structures like competition leads to wars, so we can't have a competitive society. We have to have a cooperative one. So there's a tight logic there. And of course, it's the stuff that seeks out, uh, sneaks out in the cracks uh, where maybe the real interesting thinking can happen. Um, one of the things that some of you know I've been struggling with is a group of economists and they do not follow a logical structure very much. <laughs> so they'll say things uh, and not look at the secondary consequences. My favorite example is that around the world now, states, uh, nations, corporations, cities are making strong statements about cutting CO2 by say 2035 by some fixed percent. But they're not saying anything about what they're gonna do in the next year to do that. And I think everybody's terrified of the obvious and that is to cut CO2 in a significant uh, level is going to require cutting jobs. There's just no way around it. We cannot create the new jobs fast enough to take up uh, the gap that's created by shutting down CO2 emissions. Isn't it an employment opportunity to do all the switching? Uh, no, uh, for several reasons. First of all, the new employment is not going to be where the people are who are going to lose their jobs. So they're going to have to move. And all new jobs use energy without question. And that's uh, not terrific for the environment. Well, there's going to be a massive shift to electric, which has all kinds of implications for the power grid, power generation, all that. But at the same time, photovoltaic uh, energy prices have plummeted, like to, to yes. the point where energy too cheap to meter seems to be coming off of the glowing ball of gases in the sky. So let's look at the logic. We're gonna replace gas with electricity. Now it isn't just the price point that's important. What's important is if you have a house that's heated with gas, you've got to take out that gas furnace, which is probably tied into the architecture of the building with flues and things, replace it with an electric furnace. So we're talking about on the average somewhere between 10 and $20,000 to make that retrofit. Who's gonna pay for that? Not only that, if you look at the number, we've got somewhere on the order of 60 million homes in the US heated by gas. You're gonna replace those with electric furnaces? How many does that take? Well, it takes 60 to 80 million for- what if, you, what if you turn off the gas and just leave it in place, don't worry about it, and then find alternate ways of heating spaces like light pipes or hot water or thermal heated by the sun or whatever? What if we find new methods all those things are expensive uh, labor-wise, and they're also expensive in terms of the use of materials. Well, labor-wise, that sounds like employment and use of materials. Yeah, we got that. Those are some of the challenges. I don't, anybody else feel strongly about, uh, about the, the, the bump in the road toward trying to achieve any of these savings or, yeah, or shift? I have, a different, I have a different perspective than Doug, with all respect. There's a bunch of folks who've been working hard on this. Um, uh, I, I think, Doug, you're right to point to the, you know, to the logistical constraints, not the technical or economic constraints. Um, uh, you know, from work I've been done, uh, looking at one of the barriers is the availability of trained contractors and tradespeople to do all the work. 
Uh, but that's, you know, th that's like you say, that's, a jo that's jobs as well as a barrier. Uh, so um, the Dutch have done a thing called Energie Venda, which is a, a, a mass retrofit at scale program rather than doing house by house, doing 10,000 homes at a crack, which gives you very different economies of scale. RMI has been examining that in the United States in New York State and a couple of other places. We're trying to crank something like that up for the Bay Area. Um, um, the barrier to me seems to be more mindset. When I was working at City, City of Palo Alto, the the municipally owned progressive electrical utility, which operates gas and electric business said, oh, interesting, let's pilot maybe one or two of these a year. Thinking in particular about hot water, heat and moving to heat pumps. Uh, and my approach was if we've got 25,000 households in the city and about 10% of water heaters die every year because they have a 10 to you know, 10, 12 year lifetime. Well, then in theory, if we have the right infrastructure in place, we should be able to replace, you know, 90% of the 10% per year and do 25,000 homes in 10 years instead of in 100 years. Um, the challenge here is that most uh, building energy efficiency programs and regulation uh, uses the action point of new construction. So Berkeley says no new gas hookups in new construction. Doesn't hit the problem that Doug is talking about. Um, but new construction is, you know, is 1% per year of the building stock. Uh, and so, you know, maybe two in some locations and we don't have 50 to hundred years to transform our building stock. Yeah. So the question is how do you build programs for retrofitted speed that are affordable job generation, generating net energy positive uh, and easy for people to do? So, you know, case in point on the water heaters, if you're a home, well, uh, here, case in point here, we have a home, we have a, a rental unit, we have tenants, our water heater failed on a Saturday night some years ago. All I could do was get whatever I could get the next morning. There was no time to muck around. If instead, if there was an 800 number to my utility company, to a concierge program that had pre-selected equipment, vetted contractors, permits already pulled, financing in place, paid for on bill, then, you know, then I'm done. It's easy. I don't have to worry about it. I make one phone call, it's solved. So we can think through stuff like that, I think, and address a lot of the concerns that Doug raised, maybe not all of them, but uh, this is a challenge of, you know, we have to do this. So how do we design a way to make it possible rather than say it ain't possible from where we are now? Yeah, I'm, I'm also reminded of a conversation years ago, I don't know, decade and a half ago, I think at a retreat where somebody was describing the energy costs of a database lookup. <clears throat> and this is maybe in the earliest, earliest days of Google Maps and other sorts of things where it was like, hey, soon we're all going to have devices where like on my phone for free, I'll be able to navigate in real time. And, and this person's logic was there's no way that's going to happen because look how much it costs to fill a screen with, with information at any one time. And if you'd followed that logic, like none of the services that exist today would exist. And you could then say, yes, because we're crazily subsidizing super hot data centers that are drawing whatever. I mean, there's, there's a bunch of maybe alternate logic there, but, but you would not have seen all of the stuff that we're using today that we take for granted. Go ahead, Ken. Yeah, I, I read an article a couple of years ago about um, uh, data centers run things at as close to high capacity as possible. So there's instantaneous, if we were willing to have a small delay, we could turn down the energy co uh, consumption of a huge number of server farms way, way down. But because everybody, businesses want everything right away, um, they have to run these things at, at full capacity. So I'm trying to, I'm sorry, Pete, I, I'm, I'm trying to remember something that I read from like five years ago, but it was a very compelling article about how, because business demands things instantaneously, that puts a much larger energy load on it than if, if we were simply willing to have, you know, plug your query in, you'll get your answer in 30 seconds instead of 0 0.03 seconds, right? So... The worst, the worst case of that is with the is with the trading desks where, uh, you know, finance companies are putting are, are renting buildings closer and closer to the stock exchange's server so they can shave nanoseconds off of their response time. For high frequency trading. trading. Uh, yeah, John Kumi, uh, I put his name in the chat, is the go-to guy about inter internet energy use. Gil, are you also on the Metamos chat? I forget. Um, I'm, 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 try, I'm trying not to be actively engaged in this call. I just wanted to listen and get back. Oh, good. You're doing a good job of that so it's, far. It's like, it's, it's, job, like, it's, like, it's, like, it's like Michael, it's like Michael Corleone, man. He just keeps sucking me back. 
<laughs> no problem. No problem, Gil. Um, it, it, it turns out I'll, the data I'll, centers are also where there's a lot of innovation in yeah. controlling things. Uh, so big companies like Facebook or Google uh, have a, a huge efforts in in setting up AIs that control the the building temperature and and they're using things like louvers and stuff to that you know the the computers automatically open up at the right time and close at the right time to keep everything going. So I I think you're right. Um, you know responsiveness drives energy use, but it also drives energy innovation. And so um a tiny tiny story april and i were in iceland for a, a conference years ago and we got a tour of a data center that was near the keflavik airport at what used to be a nato base and so they decommissioned the nato base and one of the warehouses had been turned into a data center and um half in a data center half the energy consumed is powering the servers half the energy is to cool the place and iceland happens to have this standing cold air so they had knocked the far wall out and put air filters in the entire wall. And basically that was their cooling system. There was a standing breeze from that direction that, that was, you know, that, that dealt with the temperature. It was really, really interesting. And then, and then Iceland has green energy because so many, so much, you know, hot water near surface and lava near surface, uh, which is also why there are five aluminum plants in Iceland. Uh, aluminum moved to Iceland for the cheap green energy as well, because aluminum is the most energy consumptive thing we do as humans i think or like in one in one in one burst uh, anyway besides bitcoin uh well bitcoin's now eating that yeah exactly exactly um so uh ingrid craig pete john eric me oh hey i'm gonna pass tonight thanks no worries thanks ingrid uh craig it's that's right you went from on deck to in the batter's box right away yeah, hi, folks. Um, yeah, as I introduced last week, my uh, primary focus is on building, modeling and building a social media platform or experience, which is uh, fun, entertaining, engrossing, useful, but most of all, healthy, uh, particularly not damaging to health, mental health, emotional health. Um, you're probably all familiar, must all be familiar with the, uh, the trouble that Facebook in particular and other social media is in right now. Um, catchphrases are the attention eco economy and addiction to social media. Um, <clears throat> teenagers seeking... Uh, seeking plastic surgery so they can look more like they do and filtered selfies and crazy shit like this, which really ought not to belong in, in, in the future world. So uh, all this has been thrust uh, into the public domain to a great extent by last year's release of a film called The Social Media, uh, sorry, The Social Dilemma which many of you probably have seen. I hope you have. It's, uh, it's on Netflix. Um, a film which, uh, which demonstrates and illustrates and analyzes very, very well indeed the social harms done to almost everybody by some aspects of the way social media is made to work. So I'm very excited to join tomorrow another uh, meeting with the Center for uh, Humane Technology. This one, um, they do that on a platform called AirMeet. If anyone is familiar with that, it's a, it's a video conferencing platform, which is very nicely set up. So uh, <clears throat> these events start with a presentation or two. And then the attendees can gather around tables and have uh, more intimate conversations for as long as one has stamina to do so. Tomorrow, the presenters uh, include um, a lady named Megan Walsh from Exposure Labs, which is the company behind the film, The Social Dilemma. And what they're going to be talking about is how the team behind the film is 
uh, helping educators and social workers, people like that, to uh, uh, disseminate n th this knowledge, which uh, uh, this awareness of the harms that social media can do, and how they are, <clears throat> how the team behind the movie is ac still actively working. They can arrange private screenings, screenings at uh, clubs and schools, colleges, to uh, uh, to uh, to increase and 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 spread awareness of these things. So tomorrow they're going to present what they're doing, what they're a actually doing on a daily basis, day to day basis, to uh, to spread the word and and get people more aware and involved in, uh, in helping to fix things. So that meeting tomorrow, I, I am uh, looking forward very much to. I use my attendance and participation in these meetings to, uh, to learn more um, about all of the aspects. There are, there are there's so, so much in it, which I try to use to help me build, model and build my platform to, to be one of the useful, attractive, fun and successful ones in the future. Can you put a link to what you're building um, in the Mattermost chat? Are you on the Mattermost? Yes, I am now, yeah. Awesome, that would be great because then we can sort of follow and see what you're, what you're up to. Okay. So this website is a, it's a web app. It will work fine on your phone. You can install it as a, as a progressive web app. Cool. Those who know, know what that is. Um, and it contains a social media stream posting. You make groups, post stuff, comment on things, just like you do on That's Facebook. Right. But That's this right. has absolutely none of the harms. This doesn't attempt to uh, uh, <clears throat> to analyze your mouse movements and what you click on. It doesn't record anything that you do other than your posts and your comments. It doesn't analyze you. It's not attempting to elevate your value as an advertiser's target. Mm -hmm. It Which just leaves you alone to do what you want to do. And the other part of the app is uh, a WebRTC based uh, video, video and, and, uh, and text chat, yeah. Cool, thank you very much. Scott, did you wanna jump in? Yeah, I'm running a little experiment that relates to this. I've set my phone to black and white and I'm using my computer the same way, except when I'm working on my graphic design projects. And the reason I'm doing that is to increase the draw of real world and decrease the draw of computer world. And it's fascinating. If you work on your computer for an hour in black and white and then flip it over, the, the color will hit you like a, like it's, it's like, whoa, this is amazing. And if you just keep it there at black and white, everything else around starts to glow in a really nice way because it's it's just more interesting. So it's just an experiment I'm trying. Um, I'll let you know next week how it's going. Well, that's a super interesting idea. It's also useful to, uh, to remind uh, UI designers, user interface designers, um, to take care of people who are colorblind. The difference between orange and blue, which is a contrast I use uh, in, in some designs, is probably not. I'm glad you reminded me of that, Scott, because the di difference between those two colors for a color uh, blind person is probably indiscernible. Uh, and a, a thing that's always mystified me, I think 10% of men in particular are red, green, colorblind. <clears throat> so why did we pick those colors for the traffic light? <laughs> like, wait, one in 10? That's a lot. Yeah, that is a lot. And if you ask somebody randomly, hey, what's the order of colors on a stoplight? 
most people can't just, without looking at light, can't remember that red's on top. So position doesn't necessarily help you. And oh, it's not like the bulb say. has a shape that's like stop or go. It's just a yeah, circle, yeah. right? It's like, I, I'm really puzzled about how, how that happened. Mm. Anyway, uh, not a problem we're going to solve here. Instead, let's go to Pete, John, Eric, and then me. And uh, uh, several of us have to bounce from the call at the half hour. Uh, I remember uh, uh, first time driving into Texas, the lights are, are horizontal. Instead yes. of, so it's like, how does that work? <laughs> um, uh, good morning, all. Um, uh, one of the things that's going on in the background uh, is a discussion with Linesburg and Jordan are proceeding apace and going well, and uh, we really like them and they really like us. Um, one of the things I, I keep um, being called to say uh, in those meetings is, is that, um, uh, borrowing from Walt Whitman now, actually, uh, one of the things I'm starting to say is uh, OGM is large and contains multitudes. Um, uh, one of the cool things about OGM, I think, is that I, I haven't written up my fractal um, thing, my fractal essay, so I have to like recapitulate it really quickly here. Um, OGM doesn't have like this hard fixed membrane boundary like most organizations does. It's very fluid and very soft at the edges. Um, which I think is a beautiful thing. And it's um, um, largely credit to our heart and soul, uh, Jerry, um, to kind of make it that way and keep it that way and make it work that way. Um, so uh, the other thing I think about OGM is that it's fractal. And Jerry and I were talking about whether it's fractal or holographic. But fractal for me means it's at different scales. It's similar to itself. Um, holographic means that you can take a little part of it and it's and it can reproduce the whole thing uh, at lower resolution kind of but anyway fractal is a good way for me to think about it um, it's it's OGM whether we're you know on a Thursday call it's o OGM whether there's a hundred of us in the, the mailing list or 30 of us on Mattermost um, it's it's OGM when there's two people talking about you know, something ogm -y. So there's this OGM-ness or, you know, OGM as a verb that kind of, you know, travels out really far as, a, as opposed to like, you know, you're either in the OGM club or you're outside the OGM club. OGM isn't like that. The other thing that it made me realize is that um, most, most organizations, often organizations, especially when they get to be called to the point where they're organizations, they have a hard boundary. You're either, you're a member of the organization or maybe you're affiliated, you're, but you're a non-member of the organization. You have this membrane that you fit in or out. Um, OGM is, is really based on attraction and participation. And it's not, you know, it's not, you jump over a boundary. You kind of, you know, you, you accrete kind of, and maybe you coalesce and crystallize into FJB or, um, or flotilla or something, but you know, you also kind of drift around and you're part of other things. And, and so that's one of the things I like best about OGM. I, I um, think Kevin so, was about to, <clears throat> Kevin was looking for a, a moment to throw in some funny interjection, I think. I, yeah, I was gonna I'm make like, room for him. Two or more are gathered there, Jerry is with you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Back Indeed. to you in the booth, Pete. Um, uh, so, um, so as we contemplate, um, actually, we're getting close to signing an MOU um, with with uh, Jordan and Lionsburg. Um, it means that some part of OGM has to have the wherewithal and the membraneness to sign uh, uh, an MOU. You know, and what does that mean, and how does that work, and and I think. Every time this kind of comes up and, and, you know, we all talk about it, we all agree that we like that, you know, fuzzy boundary kind of we're attracted and participate to each other, but not necessarily by jumping over a, mem a membrane jump or, or, or punching through a membrane. So, so that's a little bit intention and I think it's going to work out great. Um, Can you define uh, MOU? What's that? Memorandum of Understanding. Define. It's a um, memorandum of understanding. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a typical. I I, I, I just needed the acronym. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to say it's it's actually very common in in business situations, especially you know whenever you before you sign a contract, you sign a contract to think about signing the contract, basically. Right. 
Yeah. And it's called an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about real quick, I'm super excited about uh, something I'm calling Massive Wiki. Um, I'm going to hit return and and uh, uh, this, this is a pre-announcement um, because it only started two days ago, even though I've kind of been working on this, the stack of it for a couple of years and thinking about it. It finally clicked for me on our, our Tuesday call. Um, this is the right way to do wiki and federated, federation of wiki pages. Um, and I don't want to, to overshadow or, or undershadow or anything uh, towards FedWiki, which I think is also a beautiful thing. But if you want classic wiki features and you want to be in the 21st century, I'm, I'm rethinking the idea of a wiki engine contains pages. It's actually the other way around. There's wiki pages and you use different kinds of tools in an ecosystem, you know, in the ecosystem to turn it into a wiki or turn it parts of it into a wiki or things like that. So um, massive stands for um, markdown, um, markdown. <laughs> markdown and semantic. No. No. Um, I, I know this really well and I've been going over and over and it's, it's uh, anyway, massive stands for, um, uh, markdown shared version files. Oh, okay. Um, each of those is kind of important. And I have two massive wikis now. One of this, the first one was an example of it. And the second one is the one that's got the manifesto and things like that. Um, I haven't clicked save yet on the part that says, here's how to read a massive wiki. Um, so that's that's the next thing. So this is kind of a pre-announcement. Don't get super excited yet. Or, or if you do get super excited, um, I'm, uh, hit me up, uh, join the channel and uh, say, Pete, how do I do that? Um, but the, the exciting part is going to come in, you know, a few weeks or, or a month or something like that when it's more put together. And Pete, correct me if I'm wrong. I just want to riff on what you're saying. Um, part of this is thinking about how if we scatter files that can be used that are sort of kept securely, redundantly, like like think about distributed, linked, open, shared, warm data in some sense, then you can suck it up into a variety of different tools and improve it and keep working it. So this body of pages, you know, ob uh, file objects that look like pages could be part of a wiki, but you could also set, then say, hey, here's a table of contents and this subset of pages is a book. Go make me an ebook right now. And the ebook would have a different skin, a different template, a different set of ground rules for what it is, and out you go the other the other direction. And many of those pages could be reused for other reasons and other purposes by other apps. So you're now separating. Usually we have like I use the brain; it has a brain file, damn it, and and all the stuff I put in the brain is not easily shared with anything else. And five years ago, Harlan rewrote the entire brain with exactly the same architecture. And I was like, damn it, that the underlying links, the tuples need to be shared in a shared space so that we can do things across brains. And that was never possible, still isn't possible. I can't do that. So I think where Pete is headed here, and I'm thrilled uh, for this experiment, uh, starts to solve those problems in a cool, simple way. And the cool thing is the tech is basically mostly there. You know, we're like 90 or 95% done with the tech stack um, and the ecosystem of it. So it's not like, it's going to take a long time to put together. It's just kind of rethinking a little bit how to do it. I, another way I think of it is like, we don't, you know, we don't, I don't say that I have an Outlook and Jerry has a Gmail. You know, we, what we say is there's a pool of email that happens, email transactions and stuff like that. But, and I dip into it with Gmail and Jerry dips into it with Apple Mail. So Wiki ought to be the same kind of thing. You know, there's a, there's a, an ecosystem of knowledge and information and use different tools to touch it and and both to touch it and then publish it out to other things, books or or websites or wikis. And the simple way to do that is to just look at files and directories on repos like GitHub. The more complicated way of looking at that is starting to look at the distributed web, distributed data technologies, which are progressing apace. I mean, they seem to be getting to some really interesting places where they could be completely functional here. And if you design the apps looking at the data properly, you can swap out the underneath uh, at some point. Obsidian is really close to a massive wiki. And so I started using Obsidian right. just two days ago. I, I installed it and started using it because Markdown, because Pete is like, you know what? It's just Markdown, just go get used to Markdown. Um, and I think George or somebody on one of our calls said, hey, I've been, I've been obsessing on Obsidian. 
Um, so I installed it and it's really interesting. And it's not, it's not multi-user though, right? Or what? It's like not, it isn't. It's it's, this it close. isn't, but it could be. It's like, it's like, it's, it's this close and it's really elegant. It's very pretty. Like, like it's simple to use. And I like that a lot. So separate thoughts for later, but I think some of the piece parts we're looking for might be showing up, including what Pete is building right now. So awesome. Wow. Um, and I've lost my cue here. Who else was, oh, wow. Massive wiki took over my entire if, chat. If you play the game right, yeah, uh, you get uh, Jerry to dump the queue. Dump there we go. Exactly. Queue. You just you just pop the queue. So John, Eric, me, and did I miss anybody else who wanted to talk? I think that's it. Go ahead, John. Okay. So this is an analogy to uh, the, the conversation you guys just had. I mean, you were talking about it's not um, Outlook versus this. It's it's the underlying database that gets you know, re repurposed and reused by different things that look at it. And it will not be new to this group, but it is to the outside world to look at the democracy problem that way. See, some people are looking at it as, oh, it's January 6th. It's, oh, it's those extremes, those people who want to, you know, say, if, if you don't agree with me, I'm going to come at you with a flag. All right, that's one class of problems. Oh, no, it's the corporations and they're, it's, uh, stealth capitalism or, or stalker capitalism and it's all this misinformation yeah it's related you know oh it's uh self-governance we don't know how to come together as a group oh it's uh, you know and then you can start going into the solution space you can go into things like uh, participatory budgeting which i've worked on um it's all of these things <laughs> they're they're all application well there are there, there's there's common there's common data and the common data includes misinformation or hypothetical information or you know relative degrees of trustable or non-trustable information um and it, and it and that earlier conversation about slow moving and fast moving there's constitutional kind of information and there's issue information and there's you know so on and so forth so um i find when I talk to people about the, the budgeting work I did, people focus on the budgeting part. They say, oh, budgeting, budgeting. Yes. You know, and to me, that's, I mean, it's not nothing, but the real interesting thing is what happened to, what happened to the Tea Party guy and the left progressive guy as they held play money in their hands and they decided how much play money to put on the table for which program because they were engaged in an activity that undercut their standard ability to characterize the other as the enemy and to, you know, go into a long rap about how wrong this was or how bad this program was or whatever, you know, and it was just like just the, the sheer uh, functionality of holding cash in your hand and putting the cash down changed the whole relationship. And uh, so um, I'm really interested in, in expanding those kinds of activities beyond budgeting, giving people things to do that have a purpose that's not, let's have a political discussion. That, that kills it right there. You know, you're, you're dead. I mean, great that Braver Angels is doing that. It's great that people are doing red, blue, all that kind of stuff. But there's a huge territory of uh, information and there's a huge territory of relationships uh, that we, we could nurture that would lead to a, a much better functioning democracy. But, but the key to it is giving people exactly the kind of thing that uh, Pete and Jerry were just talking about, giving them another way to look at the information that is important to them, and then to see what other information is adjacent to that, and then to see how that has implications for their relationships in the real world. So I'm that working on that sounds awesome. To build on it before I pass it to Kevin, we, we are metaphorically talking about building civilizational OSs. That's sort of common parlance for any geek looking at how do we fix democracy and capitalism and all that. So I, I think that the, that the metaphor is, is, is like actively in use. And I think that, that that's a really nice uh, gluing together of those things. Thanks, John. Kevin? Yeah, you know, Dave Gray in the days before his brain shrank had these change cards and uh, one of the things they would do at big oil companies, you would have the passive aggressive guy who would lob a, a killing comment in, and he would put out the elements of the change that they were ad adapting. And he said, put your hands out here and change it. And the guy couldn't sit back 
and, and having to actually engage in building on the change or tearing it down changed the whole dynamic. Uh, and it was, it was, th that was the really brilliant thing about his cards. I'm not sure if anybody's moving that forward, but, but that was, that was the real thing is, is that the passive aggressive uh, bomb thrower couldn't do it. He had to actually engage with the, the four or five parts of the problem in the change there. Uh, it, was, it was some really, it, it was, it was really brilliant. Yep. Um, and, his work on liminal thinking and how people change their minds and his illustrations of that are world-class fabulous. And that happened right before he sort of lost the program a bit. Um, and, and my analogy for that partly is that maybe he was, he had an Icarus moment. He was flying too close to the sun uh, in doing that. Um, so, yeah. Um, Eric? Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, I was thinking about what topic to talk about, and there's one. Um, like yesterday, I tried to find another word for praying because I, for me, it's like too close to Christian um, philosophy, which I don't feel attracted to anymore. Don't feel close to, and I, I couldn't find it, <laughs> and uh, and I'm like, wow, like what I really believe in, like I believe in humanism, but that doesn't make me, that doesn't give me the strength of this kind of, there's something bigger than me. Like, do I want to believe in God? Yeah, but God is also from Christian religion. So there's all these other words I could reinvent the word, but- um, There's Bokononism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, remember uh, remember Bokononism? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? <laughs> uh, Bokononism from uh, I don't know Cat's, one... Cat's Cradle. Yeah. Well, um, I'll look it up. Sorry, and, and, and you're you're putting a, a a good thought on the table, and I'm making I'm I'm having fun with it, but uh, it's okay. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's really difficult. Like that, the one thing that I found most positivity to is like possibilianism, but that's actually basically saying there's a possibility that things are true or that things exist. And I've had so many remarkable experiences in my life that I understood Yeah, there is something like coincidences that couldn't be coincidence or, or things that happened that were so astounding. But at the same time, there's nothing binding to, together easily. There's all these methods, there's Taoism, which I kind of like principles from, there's Buddhism, there's, um, yeah, more open forms like uh, Quaker. It's not, I, I don't think I would really feel at home in the Quaker meeting completely, but I would find something which is this openness to discover together, I guess. I think you would but, like Quaker meetings a lot, just having been to many. Um, yeah. Sorry, and, I, and I put I put a link to isms in my brain in the chat, which is chock ah. full of other isms you can browse. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of... Um, uh, ways of thinking about what god is and what it might be there's like natural philosophies or whatever like but it's i want to i want to practice that i can use and that i can that i know how to relate to all of this and i i thought of this other example where it was shamanistic it was we were in a sweat lodge and we we're talking about our grandparents and and how important they were and that of course it came from indian uh, ways of thinking and living and for me it meant so much to value my grandparents and to really see them in the light of like oh wow I got a lot from them and it, it gave meaning and I'm searching for yeah what what will what can I use what will work for me like in a more general sense um, I wonder I guess all of you also thought about this Oh, didn't you? There are more there are more Google searches for spiritual but not religious than any other denomination or any other thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. spiritual but not religious is, is a category yeah. in their groups. But in, and, and and I think almost every method that calls itself spiritual, I I find this like very slight guru dynamics creep in, even if they show themselves as really open and positive, um, open minded. It often becomes like yeah this is the way to look at the world and it's mm. it's not an me i think 
maybe it's closest to mysticism or something what i look for but then a practical way of doing that but i have no idea <laughs> actually basically. um so aaron you're you're on you're, you're on the quest that so many people have been on right um, and then i put in the chat foobarism.com i invented a placeholder religion yeah, just, yeah, yeah. just as a as a game so if, if, if yeah. you want edit privileges <laughs> it's a google site if you want to be able to edit there and play with it you are absolutely uh, welcome to it uh, judy did you want to jump in i was just going to say that that having moved away from traditional religions i found that i can do almost all the same things and feel the sense of connection and guidance if i just do meditation and and mostly reflect on connecting to the earth the trees nature the universe and you then end up losing the time space. So it ends up that you're in a community of all time, all space um, with various things coming in. <laughs> Love that. Um, Scott, and then I think several of us have to drop off this call and go to a, a different Zoom. Go ahead, Scott. Eric, you and I should connect on this because I've done a, a lot of research and thinking and found some interesting answers for myself. Mm -hmm. But for me, what I had heard so, something that, that really made sense to me is it's substitute the word ask instead of the word pray. And if you, because most people, meditation is not, is not praying because you're not looking for anything. A, a, the common idea of praying is that you are, you are looking for some guidance or making an appeal or something like that. And so if you simply say ask and then ask your question, and it doesn't matter if you're envisioning anything at all, it's just asking outside of yourself, subconscious, the ether, a power, you know, it, 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 mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. You're simply asking the question and the answer will show up. And you'll, and sometimes it's like, well, where it's like, yeah, yeah, I know. That's, so what do you yeah. mean? Yeah, you know, you know, or, or it's, it's just an interesting thing, but you and I can talk about this. The later answer on, lies I, I within you. Yeah. Well, it, it, <laughs> I mean, like oh. the answer will show up and where, what does that mean? Where did it come from? I don't know. Maybe it came from inside you. Maybe it came from something else, but it, but it doesn't really matter. That's a, that's a, a way of making it something, a, a, taking away some of those connotations that you're trying to get away from. And we've just opened a lovely, big, gigantic, juicy topic, and several of us have to bounce from the call. Yeah. If, if you all would like to go deeper on this, uh, whoever leaves this room last, turn off the lights. Um, I, I know that uh, Judy and Pete and I have to bounce, but uh, thank you so much. It's been like completely awesome. Mm. Thanks, all. Mm. I'll hang out with you, Eric, if you want to. Yeah, I could. Mm. So, so as I was... Um, I, had, I had watched some some lectures on uh, psychological analysis of biblical stories as a way to say why did they survive? Well, they survived for thousands of years. You can argue why, but a lot of the reason that that this person said, and I tend to agree with it, is that there's value in it. Okay, well, what's what's the value? Well, perhaps it's the collected wisdom of, of societies trying to figure out how do things work? How, do you, how should you behave? How should you treat other people? That's, that sort of stuff. So if you take the, the mysticism out of it and just say, this is our best attempt to codify how things work. So the way that, they, um, that, that he presented this was in the like the creation myth so he says okay so here's a story about how things came to be well let's let's take this apart so there's nothing god speaks now there's something and it's good okay well what does that mean and the idea that, that he came up with, it just kind of blew my mind. It's if you encounter chaos in an attempt to make order using truthful speech, what you create will be good. Mm -hmm. And I thought that's a really deep and interesting idea. And, and his whole premise is that's why it survived because it is 
it is deep and it is like mm, that you can chew on that for a long time. So it's the idea that truth is the path to what is good. If you, if you speak what's true for you, if I speak what's true for me, if we're both trying to get to what is, what's real, then you end up with something that's good or at least the best that could have happened because you're not intentionally trying to make it worse. You know, you're trying to, to find that, that space that's, um, that's true. And what I've done is I've, I've found this, like, well, what, what if the concept of a higher power is actually the, the, the embodiment of the word truth? Okay, so what does that mean? Like, well, if you, if you do something, truth in a social, a social concept, because that's, that's what we are, we're social creatures. So for example, if I betray you, odds are I'm going to be taken out at some point. So this is a bad thing, you don't wanna do this. Well, is that true? Well, it's not a fact, but it sure feels true. It feels like, okay, yeah, that's, that's, I think that's right in a, con, you know, if I help someone out, reciprocity, I will be better off. They will be better off. Things, but things will be better. Things will be good. Does that, is, does that make sense? Kind of makes sense. Does it feel true? It, in, in, in a society, it, it, it does to me. And so all I've been doing is anytime someone uses the word God in something, I try to, I try to use the word true in, instead. Not true as in what they're saying is true, but swapping out the words and saying, does this actually, does this actually work? And it's, it's been surprising how many times it actually just, just swaps in and swaps out. It's, it's really an interesting um, idea. And that, that the idea of faith in that context is belief that uh, truthful speech is the way to encounter chaos to bring about the good. And that's why you're made in the image well, because you have the ability to create things by through through your actions and through your truthful speech, and so you. And I don't know. It's just it was a fascinating thing that really kind of made me think. Wow. Okay. There's there's one camp that says this is all mystical and, and crap and and doesn't bother, and then there's the other crap. There's the other camp that says this is all fact, and those two can't they can't reconcile with each other because they're, they're diametrically opposed. But in the center is, well, you have what are facts and then you have, well, what do you do about that? And I don't think the facts, you know, people have talked about, well, what, just because you know what something is, okay, we have the, the power of the atom. Okay, what do you do with that? Do you make energy for people to use? Do you make bombs to destroy civilizations? Science doesn't tell you that. Science just tells you how to, how to make that, we've discovered that power. And I think that, that we're, we're, we're in a, a period where we're, a lot of us are suffering because we don't know, we're looking to the facts for the answers or we're looking, we're discarding the facts and saying, well, that's a bunch of crap. We need to follow the, you know, the, the, uh, the mystical side and I think that there's a point in the middle that, um, yeah. So anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out because okay. you don't have much chance. You don't have many opportunities to talk to the, about this because no, most people true. don't want to, you know, so. Yeah, but that's, that's, I think that's one of the places where it starts. It's like feeling comfortable talking about it because even when I start this topic, it's almost, I feel, part of me feels ashamed that I talk about religion because religion, yeah. Who's talking about religion? Of course, there is religious people in the group as well. Um, so it's a weirdly, there's a weird charge on talking about this. And I think it's the most essential thing to talk about. It's most meaningful to talk about this. It's most um, constructive also, but it's very hard because any answer for me is not an answer. Like anything that's 
bog down, no, bog down, uh, what did I say? Uh, anything that's like in, in stone, written in stone, that's a danger. That's like, it, it's not just the danger, but it's also deadening to, to what's alive in people. Like if, if something, already the word should for me, I don't like it. Um, I don't like the word should. What should we do? No, I think there might be one thing is better than the other within a certain context, but it's never going to be a rule because every context is different, relativity, but also uh, ethics are even like at first I thought, okay, it's a difference between ethics and morals. Like morals is the way how you should behave and ethics is the is like researching what feels what is like better than the other what is what is most worthwhile pursuing but it's not actually working that way because ethics also have this way of turning into a moral or a should automatically once you think this is better than the other it automatically sifts and i think that's what happens when talking about religion and about spirituality it's hard to feel free in this space. It's hard to really be open and have a, a conversation where you really try to discover what this is about without falling into a trap of loyalty in a certain moment. There's always this moment where, where, ah, okay, now I figured it out. I, I've got this really insight. Ah, I've got truth now. So if it's truth, then I have to follow it. But I think truth is not about following. And that's a weird, no, it's a weird it's, dynamic. It's hard it's, to get free in inside of that so so with the truth the mm -hmm. the idea the, the idea that i'm postulating here and that i had heard was it's the same as science in the sense that science is is the current agreed set of okay this is this is what we believe is our, our facts and it's always changing it's always updating and it only updates and changes because we talk to each other and we say you said that that you know there's nine planets. Well, the more we look at it, now we're thinking that that one out there is not. It doesn't count anymore. And I see truth as the same thing. And it's it's not a set of facts. It's not. It, it's something that we're in. I don't think you can ever find it. I think you 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 can keep hmm. asking. You can keep saying. I think this is right. And then you say, mm, I think this is better. And I say, ooh, yeah, I think that is better. And then we sit with that for a while. And then mm, I think I think maybe this is better. And it's mm. it's not that we're going opposite. It's just that we're we're kind of going like this, you know, and we can only do that if we ask, either ask by ourselves or ask other people and have that conversation. It's the, it's the endless search of humanity is trying to figure that out. Yeah. Uh, if, Craig, if you want to say something, please do, eh? because I want to... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm actually very pleased to have landed uh, in, uh, in such a conversation because, uh, whoa, where, <laughs> where could I start? Um, I think you're right, Scott, in uh, you, you were talking about if you or a person who uh, is truthful, is honest to yourself and everyone around you on a emotional, uh, intellectual, informational, disseminating plan, there will be more goodness and truth around you and hence in the world at large. Um, can, I, can I say something really quick? I don't want to take you mm -hmm. off track. It was you just reminded me of something. One of the reasons that you that that you want to be truthful to yourself is then you can ask yourself and trust the answer. Because Indeed, if you're yeah. lying to yourself mm. and, and around you, you create this mm. this parallel worlds. And if right. you're always at least saying what your what you're feeling is true, then you can trust that when you ask yourself you're getting you're getting authentic responses um well, that's true that, once, that's kind 
oneself is the only one which one can trust, can, can really trust. Um, not necessarily implying that everyone else is lying, but there can also be uh, uh, significant weaknesses in one's own ability to understand what another person is saying, uh, as well as the other person's inability or, or weaknesses in their ability to express themselves uh, properly, grammatically, uh, verbally, even uh, emotionally, how well do they understand themselves? Where is it all coming from? So really the best quality of, of uh, uh, confirmation I think one gets from, from one's own self-reflection and conclusions on one's internal inventions. Which brings me well, to the God concept. If I, just oh, yeah, yeah. I was just going to say that 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 you there's a phrase. Oh, I've been lying to myself. It's just a funny phrase. Like, yeah, how, yeah, how can right, you do yeah. that? But but it's true. <laughs> you can. Oh, I've been lying to myself. You know, and and it's it's like yeah. Well, don't do that. If you actually think about every time you say something, think. Do I believe that? Am I saying yeah, it because, or because yeah. if I if I if I'm only saying things that I actually believe, and I'm not just saying things that you know I want to talk about religion, but I but no, I I'm just gonna not do that, you know, or whatever it happens to be. You talk about I, I think that that's important. You're attuning yourself so that you can be that one that you can trust. You know? Right. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, the, you know, the idea that God is good is, to me, patently ridiculous. It's obviously oh. not true. God is, oh. God is not good when he, she, or it brings a tornado through your village and destroys absolutely everything, but leaves the lemon meringue pie untouched on the kitchen table. I heard someone recently... Yeah. Or, yeah, someone recently in one of those tornado disasters in the States claiming that this was God's mercy because the lemon meringue pie was undamaged. I think, <laughs> Jesus, really? Where do they get these what is, people? You know? <laughs> what, what is true is not what is good. I have to rephrase that. I'm not as articulate as this person. Uh, what, what, what made me feel good about this idea of true was that that I'm not trying to deny the bad things that there's 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 things that take you that you know will take you out there's there's thing, bad things that happen there's good things that happen mm. and all of those are part of that and so if you you know it's it's the suppression of the the negative oh well we just aren't going to we aren't going to talk about that well, okay, yeah. that's not true because it's still there, you know? And so I think maybe saying that uh, what you, if you speak truth, what you create will be good is, is a, it's a tricky, it's a tricky phrase because it makes it sound like, well, all I have to do is say the truth and everything will be lemon meringue pie. And it, it, that's, that's not true, but it's, it's this idea that you are, you're not going to make it worse because you can make it, you can make things worse. Um, you might not words. be able to stop thinking uh, about it anytime soon, but you, <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> but that in itself can make, can make, make it worse. I mean, if, if it's an, an open sore and you leave it alone to fester, it will get worse. So you really better talk about it. Analogy, go to the doctor, get it treated. Uh, deal with it, you know, if, if it's something that puzzles you on this very deep, personally important level, my goodness, deal with it, you know. Okay. I like very much the Buddhist idea that, uh, or, or concept of God, uh, a, a translation is uh, 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 for the word God or a substitute is uh, the way or the way things are, the way things work. So God is good, God is not good. It is good. 
it is not good. Things are good. Things are, and they're all true all at the same time. Every moment of every day, depending on your perspective, emotionally, intellectually, financially, whatever, God is happening all the time. Not to use the Christian meaning of the word God. Things are happening as they really are, and that is what God is. It's just the way things are. And in that way, I get to think about the mysterious powers that be, those that I have no grasp of, that I don't understand, but I suspect, fear, sense, enjoy the presence of. Um, it makes it a more friendly domain than uh, than uh, the, the big old white bearded guy with the heavy hammer up in the sky who's going to punish me should I do wrong. That doesn't exist for me. It's... Uh, well, and what I found, what it, what it made true for me was that punishment is just the natural outcome of things you're doing that are hmm. not, not good or helpful. It's the social ramifications of breaking social contracts. Hmm. And so betrayal will be punished, not because there's some entity that's going to do that, but because the, the, the pressure of society will eventually, that, that will happen. And so if you simply turn it into, you know, the, the concept of God is the concept of reality, social reality. And it's this like, well, yeah, if you, if you act in a way in accordance with that, if you follow, shall we say, then things generally will work out better for you. Does that mean that it's gonna be perfect? No, no, because it's reality. And you might follow and you might run into, you know, drive off a cliff. It's still, mm -hmm. it doesn't change anything, but, but the idea of punishment is really the, it's, it's not something that, that's like, well, maybe I can, maybe I can get around that. It's like you, you live in a, in a society and the, we have ways that we interact with each other. And, yeah. you know, it only works because people follow those, generally follow those rules and, and look, you know, look frown on those who don't, smile on those who do. And, and that's, that's, to me, the blessings and the punishments. They're just kind of natural cause outcomes of- It sounds a bit more like karma, what you say, but yeah. Uh... Yeah, you reap what you sow. And oh, yeah. So it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Where do those phrases yeah. come from and why do they yeah. last so long? You know, I think <laughs> we know it. I, I would like to react still to something you said before. And for me, it's like words are so tricky, but it's not just words. It's what connotations um, and concepts and what what's part of it. Like you said, yeah, but if I look at truth in this way, then it works. But then the word truth is used in other ways so often that it's hard because once you hear a word you're automatically in the loyalty or in the in the frame that a person uses when they use the word like praying i could say yeah i'll pray in my way it will not be christian but then automatically you you revert i revert back to a kind of very okay i'm very serious now <laughs> No, um, sometimes I do this even, but it's like, but there's so much attached to it and it's really hard to let go of it, but then there's no other word. So being outside of words is also really tricky because you can't, it's hard to hold things. There's no, I mean, you could make a picture of it and then remind yourself of it. I don't know, maybe, but still it's really, on one hand, like too loose and no, no structure at all, just openness makes it hard to remember actually what you're doing and to, to keep the clarity. But then with words, there's all these connotations which, bar, which pin you down in a certain idea of what, yeah. It's like very often if I share something very openly, how I think differently, I have to know for sure that the other person hears it that way or else we're 
talking about something completely different. So how do we talk about this? How do we talk about it mm. that it stays open? And I think this this thing about multi perspective that was like uh, last week's call there was this idea that that helps because there's still this open mindset and we can have a lot of other ideas together that helps but I still wonder I, I'd like to be open but I'd like to be able to talk about it but it's really it's tricky there's such a long history that we haven't undone about it I don't know if it made is it, is it clear what I said until now? Yeah, well, the, the, the same person that taught me this said that art comes first and then articulation. And mm -hmm. art is pre-articulation. And so things like like music is, is the first. Uh, and then visual art, you know, in you know, a rough framework. And then being able to talk about it. And the idea that you can listen to a symphony, you can listen to a piece of music and be emotionally affected is very interesting. It's like, why did churches use, use these? You know, why did they, you know, most of the composers were composing, composing masses and, you know, and things like that. You know, it was, it was music to be, because it communicated something that couldn't be said. It's transcendent. And so yeah. perhaps, for for you having having musical pieces would be better because you don't have the linguistics well it's, it's, it's it. even then it's weird like i used like my favorite composer would be arvo perth and i i saw a documentary about him he's deeply orthodox believing as a person and i was kind of inspired because of his depth and he would walk through a field in his documentary and say every flower counts and in one day there was like a, a cleaning lady that came to him and he he asked her he asked to the cleaning lady like yeah what is what is good music i don't remember or something and then uh, how do you make good music and then she said something like Lo love every note and then it, it's like a beautiful statement certainly if you know his music because every note in how he composes certainly with a um, repetitive music more like it 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 counts and that's it, it's a deep beauty but still there is something about him as a person being such a devout christian and the heaviness and the pompousness of some of his music that don't make me feel that's what i want for real so it's not just it's not just the artistic <laughs> um, it, artistic is without ethics as well there is no and if it's used for ethics, then it's also problematic because often it's used to underscore a certain point. I remember uh, I was in France doing a theater thing um, and I heard on the radio the, the president that I w then was coming and it was kind of extreme right, but not really extreme yet. But a guy I didn't like, but he, his speeches with, were underlined with this music and this emotion and then it's like, ah, oh, damn, <laughs> it's a misuse. So there is no ethics yet. It's a very difficult thing. I, 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 I thought about this as well. Uh, so for me, it's still searching, like huh? how to balance it out. And somehow it does make sense. It's, I think we can recognize ethics somehow, but it's, it's a very open, constantly changing thing as well. I don't know. Ethics are applied to whatever is going on. Um, so when new things happen, a whole new school of ethics opens up. Um, one of the catchphrases in, in what I work with these days is <clears throat> ethical technology. Right. So there's technology which does unethical things like uh, uh, analyzing your personality to to, to uh, uh, increase your value as a target for advertisers. Mm -hmm. This is how Facebook and others make their money. This is unethical because the, uh, uh, there are many harms involved in, uh, uh, at, your, at your cost, to your cost, in the way they do this. 
So there is a whole new school of ethics, philosophical, analytical endeavors applied to technology. Mm. So ethics, like everything else is fluid. I think the, the only thing you said written in stone, the only thing that can be written in stone is that everything is fluid. <laughs> you know, everything yeah, yeah. is moving and changing all the time. So ethics um, are relevant until an issue is resolved in the mainstream to a yeah, and large think, part, and then something new will come along to be ethical yeah, about. That's, that, that again then sounds a bit like Taoism where the way you can't name the path if you try to name the path, the path is already gone or something. Like it's like mm -hmm. Tao is, you can't <laughs> really get it. There is no rule and the rule is always turned over to its opposite and it's both can be true and the small will affect the big and big will affect the small other kind of stuff. But still, mm -hmm. it's my There's body no destination. Huh? There's no destination. Yeah. It's so, a path. Okay. It it's sounds, the process it, which is yes. Yes. a healthy endeavor. Yeah. Uh, it, yes. it sounds yes. good. It sounds good. And then you would say, oh, okay, let's do Taoism. But then my main bodywork training was Taoism. And they went really deep in bodywork. They could do things that people would consider miracles. Like some people get treated for things that normally you would have a, a, a regular treatment for years or something. I literally heard stories about things a lot of people would call miracles, but true body work, and, but a very deep understanding of body work, people would be helped. But then in that same school, I, I heard so many things that for me were considered unethical. <laughs> and there was so much power stuff going on all the time. And, and the power stuff was not nice. And there were, there was so much going on that for me, like they were talking about the heart all the time, but then in, in the way they were doing, dealing with the power stuff, the heart wasn't there. It was just people protecting their power position and stuff. Mm. So it's a, it's a funny thing. Often there's like, on one end, there's like a, a light or a brightness and a sincerity and a heartfelt and a, and a fluid even and a humorous. But then in other moments, all the, shit comes up and it starts becoming guru-esque again <laughs> so, yeah it's funny so how to keep it open i was just thinking yeah maybe call it like open sensible free ethics or something but it doesn't sound like anything but it's kind of what it's about but <laughs> it's funny how it, it's it's hard to pin down and i, I think it, it it's not meant to be pinned down maybe or it, it's not the process is not about pinning it down, but what what if it's not? What do we do then to support the process in the best possible way? I guess that's maybe a question that I have. Yeah. Yeah. There's certainly plenty in the world around us to apply uh, these uh, uh, questions and searches to. Yeah. So much of what we all do, what everybody does is, uh, I don't really want to say fake, but it's not true to what is actually required. And I think the cynic in me believes and feels that most of the time, most people are lying to themselves, not being truthful to themselves and certainly not thereby, therefore, certainly not being truthful with, with everybody else. Mm. If anyone else is anything like me, then, then we harbor doubts and concerns as well as joys and pleasures. Um, of course. So we share the joys, we get together for the pleasures and the joys, and the doubts and concerns, we tend to... As you alluded to uh, earlier, Eric, you're even reluctant to bring this subject up. Mm. Do you know? Uh, and I think that's a that's a tendency. And I'm very glad that you that you do it anyway, because uh, I think most most of us, myself included, don't do that most of the time. Mm. And 
I guess so yeah. we, we miss out on opportunities to make some progress in these fields. Yeah, I, by what you're saying, I get two insights and I'm not sure if I can articulate them then I, I'll try like, it makes me think on one end of, of Hannah Arendt, which basically said something like everything is political. Everything we say and do is political. There is a, we as a person, pe people are political beings. So you can't take yourself out of the political realm. You always make decisions politically. <clears throat> and with that comes the responsibility that politics <coughs> have. If I'm saying I'm just going to do my own thing and uh, build my own um, garden, uh, live off the grid, it's still polit a political statement. And it has influence because and it's not necessarily the best influence. I don't know how to express this. It's like, yeah, I don't know. How, I'll try to wrap this up in a way, but it's like on the other end, the, the idea that I had is like radical honesty and then uh, being really honest, like speaking your truth, like a bit like Scott says, I think it does make sense. Um, and there's, there's these ideas like radical honesty, which I developed. And then I can see yeah, a lot of people aren't honest. And then I know this uh, NBC trainer that said, yeah, at first I was being honest, but then I was being really rude and it didn't work well, of course, for others. And I said, yeah. and then I found out about like something like vulnerable honesty. Let's be vulnerable and honest. And it's kind of, it's like a step closer again to something that makes sense. But if I combine this, like being honest to yourself and, and, and that we're political human beings, I think that's, that's a lot is being said there already, but it's, it's a hard practice because there's all these rules about being polite or like social norms and rules. And some of them are really clear and other are less outspoken. And, and the way we constantly judge each other and put each other in boxes, but then, yeah. Mm. I don't yeah, know. There's a, it's, it, <clears throat> there's a social art where I'm no expert, but I recognize its existence and mm. uh, uh, necessity. There's, there's an art uh, in, in being, so if you're going to be brutally honest, you will be rude and you'll upset a lot of people. Mm. And when you know that, you want to be socially successful and enjoy your life among the people around you. So you have to modify that. So if you're going to be really vulnerably honest, you will uh, suffer uh, a lot in different ways. And that's not going to work so very well either. But you still want to be honest because, uh, as I think we three all agree, honesty and uh, truthfulness and doing good things uh, uh, are the way we want to go. So the art is in managing oneself um, successfully such that one can be honest, um, completely honest all the time, but do it with, uh, with social finesse, such that uh, I think probably if you, if, if you get good at it, you can make people laugh, you can make people sit up and, and, and pay attention, but not be upset, be intrigued more, than uh, than insulted. Um, I think we end up we end up not wanting to hurt someone or not wanting to have a conflict in the short term and push that down the road. Mm -hmm. If if I just am nice now and don't say what I really feel, then I don't have to deal with this. And I think that's incorrect. And that's because the political I think failure. You're not you, making any progress. You do progress have to deal with way. it. You have to deal with it, but eventually, and it just gets bigger. So, mm -hmm. you know, in a very simple way, you know, with your family. Well, okay. So if someone's asking you for an opinion about something and you, and you don't say it, and you don't say it, and you don't say it, and five years go by, and now they, they have a sense of who you are, and they don't. And one day you've had enough and you say, you know what, 
I'm tired of you talking about this, or I've always hated that <laughs> painting on the wall. Yeah, yeah. And they, they, they're like, it's like you slapped them because you're just telling them what you would have told, should have told them the first time, but yeah. you didn't. And so now it's built this thing. And now all of a sudden it's this, like, who are you? And, and I think that's where, where it runs into trouble is, is, you know, politically in our country, you know, we, we didn't, we didn't really talk about politics. We don't really talk about religion. We don't really, and then suddenly, wait a minute, how did we get so far apart? I had no idea. And yeah, so, well, cause more. it was there. Yeah, but that's, there. that's also, yeah. Okay. But that's also, we are just learning like, only from the 50s onwards, I'm not sure. There were pedagogical and psychological people writing before, like the real boom of psychology and pedagogy. And, and maybe also like philosophy as something that we as a society do. We philosophize together as a larger society, not just the, the intellectual elite or something. That's very new. So we haven't learned to talk to each other and we're still at the beginning stage of that. So that's kind of normal also that we're not yet honest. There's all these people practicing it. It's still, yeah. yeah. But we are making progress by realizing, as you've just said, look, it's only been two or three uh, uh, generations that uh, this level of intellectual and endeavor has, ha has even been possible. And we're very much still finding our way and we're making progress mm -hmm. with the realization that by not saying what you should have said when you felt it, because mm -hmm. why would you not say it? You didn't want to upset somebody means or implies that you still have not developed. You still lack the <clears throat> The, 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 the life art that I alluded to, you were not able to manage yourself well enough to say what needed to be said in a way that was not going to cause sparks and fire. So you didn't say it. And years went by, as you, uh, uh, as you said, Scott, and uh, a toxic neurosis developed and built up and built up and it spills out of yourself into all the other people, affects us all. And yeah. in the end, we've got rednecks storming the Capitol building. We are making progress by realizing the detrimental effects of our inexperience uh, uh, and our weaknesses. Yeah, I think the biggest, yeah. Oh, there's so much now. My head is so <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I think one of the things, I think one of the big problems is also listening rather than talking often. Uh, right. But, um, so I, I, we started with this idea of, yeah, for, for me as at least, it's like, what's an alternative to all these ideas about God? And, and you just we... made me remember something. It's another phrase. Hmm. It's kind of an old phrase, but it's pray, do tell me. It's, it's this yeah. using that word as, as, as an ask or as, yeah. a, as a request. And it's this idea that maybe asking you is a form of, of pray. You know, when I said, please. instead of using the word pray, use the word ask, please, please. yes, yeah. exactly. May I um, ask Eric, when you, can, when you think about praying, who are you praying to? What are you praying to? That's, not, that's not even not answerable. Like I, I believe, oh, how to explain this? I believe trying to put it down will, I think there's a lot of, everything's there. Maybe let's start there. Everything's there. I think who I am, I, I learned just through uh, this guy, Peter Russell. He's a, a non-duality guy. Uh, Non-dualism, non-duality. Non um, and he, he explains like, that consciousness is primary by saying we've got a map of the world around us. If 
you come to your house and uh, the doorknob is like 10 cent five centimeters off, you would notice it because you've got a map of everything around your surroundings. And then he says, we actually have everything in our mind, everything that we know and exists, exists in us. Me meeting you and seeing you and who you are is still me because it's my consciousness perceiving you. So if I, if I talk and if I pray, I pray to everything. I, I pray to the, everything that exists within me. So, and uh, the way, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, Team-centered interaction by Ruth Cohn or something, I don't remember. He, he says kind of something like, uh, intuition is everything we know from our whole life. So when, when you delve into intuition, that's, that's a scientific approach mm -hmm. to intuition. It's like, you can't know anything you don't know. You just connect to everything you know already. But then I've also noticed that in my life, there's so much that happens beyond the realm of normal communication. Like I've had so many coincidences and so many things happening that at a certain moment it became clear, yeah, there is information traveling in other ways. So it's like, so I'm talking to everything basically, but I'm, yeah, I don't I, know what it is and I don't know when I'm talking. Yeah. So it confuses me as well. <laughs> yeah, no, I like, I like that, that, uh, that answer and that whole, uh, okay. whole approach. It's why I like the, the, the Buddhist idea of, uh, okay. of God being the way things work. Yeah. So, I mean, I pray also, but. I'm talking to myself. I'm talking. I'm not talking to a, a, a god figure. I'm just talking to the universe. Uh, how can I? Why is it? Uh, I wish it was. And then I remember things like, well, be the change you want. Find somewhere to start. Yeah. Obviously, talking to the universe like this is an expression of uh, of discontent or. Uh, uh, malcontent whatever um yeah well one since... wishes things could change so start then is always my answer to myself find a place to start and make the first move yeah, yeah. well those are principles and they can help to, mm. to get unstuck for sure yeah i wonder sometimes if you know every time we experience something observe observe something you know, from the from the moment we're born and everything that enters our mind stays there um but is not in the 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 the, the immediate reaches of, of of your attention and so when you've lived through years and experienced billions and billions of moments that you haven't even paid attention to yet all the information is in there so when uh, something inspires a, 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 a thread of sparks, um, it might feel like intuition or, uh, mm -hmm. or a realization or actually not. You know this stuff already because you've seen it. Mm -hmm. Didn't even register that you were seeing it, which kind of marries into this idea that uh, that you were just talking about you we have a map of everything around us because we've pretty much seen everything you I might not have seen your front door but yeah. a, a map is a tricky thing because it's not about a map for real but yeah it's much more than just a map. I think we understand things visually and there's so many layers to that. Anyhow, uh, <laughs> I wanna. I, I need to round up because I I start feeling tired. Uh, also because I haven't slept well the last couple of nights. Um, yeah. I so how to wrap up? I. How are you, Scott? I'm good. Um, yeah. I think the way to wrap up for me is to say thank you for opening this topic. 
Mm. It's been very interesting to talk about. And for me, this has been the conversation in front of the fire for thousands and thousands of years. And that is, that, that is what it is. It's the conversation. It's, it's so, as you said so many times, there's so much, there's just so much. And I think that's why it's, it's, it's endless. It's just this, you can always dive into it because mm -hmm. you don't find the bottom. You realize, as you said, well, it's, it's just everything. And it's like, yeah, it is. And that I think is, that's fine. That's, that's actually the way it is. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, you're right. This conversation, I've been having this conversation for well over 50 years. Uh, it, it's never ending and it's, uh, it's, it's always a good one. So thank you, Eric. That's, that's <laughs> all I want. Yeah, well, I know do it from here, of course. <laughs> but it's, uh, I, or maybe another way to put it, like I, uh, it gives me a good feeling that, that for you, it was meaningful to talk about this. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah uh, it is, I, I think it's uniquely human to not just live your life, but to think about living your life. And that's, that's just part of yeah, what we do. We, we can't just live. We have mm -hmm. to think about how we do that. And we think so we are human. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yes. Uh, as gentlemen, soon as we discover me, time. Yeah. Let me say good night, gentlemen. It's one uh, twenty in the morning where I am. Oh, I, sh yeah. I should be off to bed. Uh, ah, yeah, I'm I'm ah, in Thailand. Thailand, ah, really? Yeah. Ah. yeah. So uh, your morning is my evening, and uh, now it's no, no, sleep, sleep. Now it's sleep. <laughs> <Good night>. <laughs> it's <laughs> okay. been a great pleasure. I'll uh, I'll see you next week, I I guess. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. See you then. Have a good week. Be well. Have a good night. Right. Bye, Craig. Bye, Bye Eric. Bye, Craig. Bye, Scott. Turn out the lights. <laughs>